Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our study on righteousness by faith. And um, this series uh, that we've been looking at um, is the th three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. So before we begin, uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath, and we are thankful for the promises in your word about where two or three are gathered together. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be here to speak to us, to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, to fill us. We ask, Lord, that um, your character can be manifest in our lives. We need you every moment, every hour of every day. And we need you now, especially in the time in which we live. We need to be aware of our sins, our shortcomings. We need to seek you to overcome. We need your help. We pray for the people who are watching these studies, the people in this movement. Um, for anyone who is looking for truth, we ask, Lord, that your angels can be around them and that you can guide and direct their minds and their thoughts. We pray for the various needs that exist and the struggles that we face. And so we just ask that as we study together, we will be strengthened um, for the challenges that lie ahead. Give us light for our feet, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening and happy Sabbath. And um, we're continuing this study. This is number eight. And tomorrow afternoon, we'll have number nine in the studies. Now, we have been looking at A.T. Jones. And I know not everyone is completely familiar with this whole history. Now, A.T. Jones... In this study, uh, this is from the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, he's going to recount uh, the history that he had a part to play in, which was uh, dealing with the Blair Bill. Uh, this had to do with uh, the World's Fair, and um, there was a call to have a, the World's Fair not to occur on Sunday, that they would enforce sort of a, a Sunday law. And Jones was called to present before a Senate committee, and and he's going to talk about that presentation. Let's be direct. This was in regard to the Chicago World's Fair. Yeah, yeah the Chicago's World's Fair, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. Chicago at that time was seen as being the stockyards to the world, but has now become fairly socialist in many of its views. Yeah, well, Chicago, I mean, it used to be the, the biggest city, uh, you know, east of New York or something like that, or west of you know, New York, I mean. So um, I remember that uh, the biggest city that was west of Chicago used to be a place in British Columbia called uh, Lillooet. Um, and that was a, a town that was part of the gold rush. Um, so, uh, but it's much smaller now. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, yeah, so this, this was the Chicago World's Fair. Now, so this, of course, would have been a national Sunday law that people were calling for. Correct. And, you know, so it wasn't something that just was uh, local to the state of Illinois. It was to the, all of the United States. And, um, and Jones spoke before this Senate committee on this. Now, he's going to start here, but he's going to take this text, uh, which is a statement of the spirit of prophecy. This is actually from December 29th. Um, 1893 that it's published um, 
but this is the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. So this would have been a very new statement uh, that Jones is here uh, quoting. So this is something that Ellen White had, um, and he says it's a familiar statement to all. So I'm not sure when exactly this was written, but it was November 1st, 1893, pardon me. Um, but it was the reading for Friday, December 29th. So November 1st, 1893. So I'm not sure when the, the general conference was, but it would have been something that uh, that was current, it was a current statement in the spirit of prophecy that he's quoting here. <clears throat> so the statement is the people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being the people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being trans transacted before us will no longer trust in human inventions and will feel that the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, and presented before the people. Now, when we think about the Holy Spirit, um, in 1893, I would say that Seventh-day Adventists had a much different idea about what this state would, statement would mean than the average Adventist who would read this statement today. Now, why do I say that? How is... How is so, yeah. uh, you're seeing that the Holy Spirit must be recognized yeah. received and then presented before the people. It's like it's a message or something. Ah, okay. Like the Holy so, Spirit is a message. Right. So so we wouldn't think of it that way. What we think of the Holy Spirit is some, you know, just generally in Christianity, as some kind of power, right? Some kind of power that's going to come upon us. But she says the Holy Spirit must be recognized received but the other thing is presented before the people now when we say it's presented before the people even now if somebody was going to they would just say well the whole thing we need to talk about the holy spirit the outpouring of the holy spirit um you know receiving the holy spirit but ellen white sees that this work of the holy spirit isn't just some mystical experience that people have it's something that's added to or part of the messages that are going to be given to the world. That is, the Holy Spirit is a power that is going to be added to these messages. But it's not just talk of the Holy Spirit. That is, the talk of the Holy Spirit is not a message in and of itself. But No, no it looks like it's because it has to be recognized, right? So mm -hmm. it seems as though that you would have to recognize it, that it's actually light. Right. It's connected to the idea of light. So I want to go to Ellen White's statement itself, because this is just the first, uh, the first sentence in, right. in her article. So here's the article from November 1st, 1893. The people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being transacted before us will no longer trust in human inventions and will feel that the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, presented before the people that they may contend for the glory of God and work everywhere in the byways and highways of life for the saving of the souls of their fellow men. Oh, how we need the divine presence. For the baptism of the Holy Spirit, every worker should be breathing out his prayers to God. Companies should be gathered together to call upon God for special help, for heavenly wisdom, that the people of God may know how to plan and devise and execute the work. Especially should men pray that the Lord will choose his agents and baptize his missionaries with the Holy Spirit. For 10 days, the disciples prayed before the Pentecostal blessing came. It needed all that time to bring them to an understanding of what it meant to offer effectual prayer, drawing nearer and nearer to God, confessing their sins, 
humbling their hearts before God, and by faith, beholding Jesus, and becoming changed into his image. When the blessing did come, it filled all the place where they were assembled, and endowed with power, they went forth to do effectual work for the master. So what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit, according to this paragraph here? Essentially, to be a change agent, to change us into the to God's image. Because we can't be effective in giving a message if we don't don't have Christ's character. Yes. Yeah. So we know an intellectual understanding of truth is insufficient to equip a person to do God's will. We need to be changed. We need to confess our sins. Now, this is, of course, what happened to the disciples in that 10 days. That 10 days that they were in the upper room. Reconciling with one another. Seeing their faults. And, and then they were able to receive this power to to give the gospel, to proclaim the message of salvation uh, to the world, right? Because they had now the gift of tongues and the people from all over the world who were gathered in Jerusalem would hear this message. And so what they did was typical. Would we agree with that statement? Because we know it was a fulfillment of the prophet Joel, right? Right. But how, how would I say that it's typical? How would we argue that it's typical? Well, um, this is the same as... Isn't this the same as... Um, Jacob wrestling with God. Isn't, okay. isn't this a, the same as um, um, oh, I can't think of anything, any other thing. Okay. Well, so one is, it occurs in Acts chapter 2, verse 7, 17, pardon me. So Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it's going to quote the prophet Joel, which is quoting, um, 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 that's Joel, which chapter, I always forget. Um, Joel 2, verse 28 to 32. Um, but it's Acts uh, 2, verse 17. So what would be the significance of Acts 2, 17? It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So what is, this is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So what would be the significance of this? Acts 2, verse 17. What's 2.17? Uh, February 17th. Well, uh, Iran has it there in the or chat. Or 721. It's, it's um, yeah, July 21st, midnight. It's also Raphia, 
The Battle of Raphia happened in 217 BC. Right. Um, so we so we have this symbol of 217 here. So this is a symbol of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to come in the future. So even though it's a fulfillment of the prophet Joel, it's not the complete fulfillment of it. Right, that's going to happen in the last days when the Holy Spirit, the latter rain is poured out. Right. Okay. So so it is typical and it has some symbols that we can address that that we can connect to uh midnight. Um, and rain on the ark started on the 17th day of the second month in Noah's 600th year. Right? Right. So we have that that symbol, the, the, the rain beginning to destroy the earth. Now, um, so we're going to go on and read a bit, a um, bit more of what Ellen White says here. Um We should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. If they needed it at that time, we need it more today. Moral darkness, like a funeral pall, covers the earth. All manner of false doctrines, heresies, and satanic deceptions are misleading the minds of men. Without the Spirit and power of God, it will be in vain that we labor to present the truth. We must have the Holy Spirit to sustain us in the conflict, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness, um, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We cannot fall as long as we hope and trust in God. Let every soul of us ministers and people say, as did Paul, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but with a holy faith and hope in expectation of winning the prize. Say to your soul, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. By precept and example, encourage faith, confidence, assurance. This is the work of the comforter, and it is your work to cooperate with God's agencies. Um, Now, when we deal with this idea, faith, confidence, assurance, we notice three, right? And we know that the work of the comforter is to convict the world or convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Can we parallel faith, confidence, and assurance with sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, how would we do that? Okay, so we have this yes. So when it comes to faith, confidence, and assurance, now these are all things that are, they're similar, right? I mean, we know that the Bible talks about the full assurance of faith. Correct. Yes. But when we talk about faith and assurance, um, in a human sense, those are actually not the same thing. Because if I'm going to borrow some money um, and somebody's going to lend it to me, uh, what do they need in order to lend me that money? Collateral. The collateral. Okay, collateral. And collateral is which one of these? Is it faith, confidence, or assurance? Assurance. It's assurance, right? So now the person might also need faith and confidence. I mean, because even though he has some collateral, I mean, he may not be as interested in that collateral as just receiving the money, right? Collateral, of course, will protect him if I default on that that loan. And depending on what kind of collateral he gets, I mean, he might be happy if I default, I guess. 
Um, but he needs assurance. Now, when we talk about the full assurance of faith, well, faith is to trust in someone. Now, of course, we usually have trust in somebody who's trustworthy. Right? I mean, it's, it's kind of presumptuous to trust in someone who isn't trustworthy. I mean, I could have faith in somebody that's not trustworthy. But when we talk about faith, faith is, is a little bit different than assurance. And what about confidence? How is confidence different from faith? Trust. Okay, think of the word confidence. It's, it would be like having confidence in your car to get somewhere, right? Okay, but I'm, I'm thinking more about when you bring somebody into your confidence, what are you doing? You trust in them. Okay, you're, you're entrusting them. Yeah. Right, so now it's, it's you could have faith in somebody, but, but to have confidence you have a strong belief that that person is going to fulfill their promises. So can we look at this faith, confidence, and assurance as progressive, not just the restating of the same word, three different ways, but as something that's progressive? Because she says this is the work of the comforter. And the work of the comforter is to convince of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Sin because they believe not on me. On righteousness because I go to my father. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And confidence, he says, because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Right? So can we see this as progressive? We've, we've said that we, we can, that we can see it's parallel to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, if this is the work of the comforter, and it is your work to cooperate with God's agencies, what, what are God's agencies? How do we cooperate with God's agencies? What's what's an agency? It would be someone like you, wouldn't it? You right. would be an agency, right? Well, an agent, an agent. In order to have an agency, you need an agent, right? A representative. Right. Representative. Right. So God has representatives. He has agencies. Now, some of these agencies are angels. That is, God has angels that are working, and we need to cooperate with those angels. Yes. Right. And we can all say the Holy Spirit is also an agent, right? Because it's an agent of Christ. Yes. Christ sent us the comforter because he wouldn't be with us, but he could be with us through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit. So she says, it is true that every moment is precious and not one of them is to be wasted, but it is when you obtain the grace of the Holy Spirit through faith in God, that you are qualified for the performance of your various duties and can work with an eye single to the glory of God. Look at the days and weeks and months of the past and see if your life of service has not been one long, complicated robbery of God because you have failed to remember him and have left eternity out of your reckoning. By neglecting spiritual things, you have not only robbed, robbed your own soul, but the souls of your family. For by seeking temporal enrichment to the neglect of heavenly enlightenment, you have not been in a condition either physically 
or mentally to educate and train your children to keep the way of the Lord. And we can all say that this is true of us. Doesn't it also affect those around you, not just your children? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what she says. Yeah. So it's it's it fails. We're robbing the souls of our family, but everyone, right? You have a serious, solemn work to do to prepare the way of the Lord. You need the heavenly unction, and you may have it. Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. There needs to be an elevating up power, a constant growth in the knowledge of God and the truth on the part of one who is seeking the salvation of souls. If the minister utters words drawn from the living oracles of God, if he believes in and expects the cooperation of Christ, whose servant he is, if he hides self and exalts Jesus, the world's redeemer, his words will reach the hearts of his hearers, and his work will bear the divine credentials. The Holy Spirit must be the living agency to convince of sin, right? So that's the work of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, to convince of sin. First step, the divine agent presents to the speaker the benefits of the sacrifice made upon the cross. And as the truth is brought in contact with the souls present, Christ wins them to himself and works to transform their nature. He is ready to help our infirmities, to teach, to lead, to inspire us with ideas that are of heavenly birth. How little can men do in the work of saving souls, and yet how much through Christ, if they are imbued with his spirit. The human teacher cannot read the hearts of his hearers, but Jesus dispenses the grace that every soul needs. He understands the capabilities of man, his weakness, and his strength. The Lord is working on the human heart, and a minister can be to the souls who are listening to his words, a saver of death unto death, turning them away from Christ. Or, if he is consecrated, devotional, distrustful of self, but looking unto Jesus, he may be a saver of life unto life to souls who are already under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and in whose hearts the Lord is preparing the way for the messages which he has given to the human agent. Thus the heart of the unbeliever is touched and it responds to the message of truth. Ye are laborers together with God. The convictions implanted in the heart and the enlightenment of the understanding by the entrance of the word work in perfect harmony. The truth brought before the mind has power to arouse the dormant energies of the soul. The Spirit of God, working in the heart, cooperates with the working of God through his human instrumentalities. So when we look at what she's saying here, the need of the Holy Spirit is not something that's, I mean, it is for us, but it's not something where we, we get the Holy Spirit and now we, we somehow are, um, you know, we have some kind of experience, you know, so not some kind of an ecstatic experience. It's actually a cooperation with God, with his Holy Spirit. You're saying it's not an emotional experience. Yeah, it's not, it's not an emotional experience, which often that's what people are looking for. I mean, you know, generally in the Christian world, um, you know, I've been to Pentecostal churches in the past, and you have lots of demonstration of the Holy Spirit in their minds, but you don't have much demonstration of the Holy Spirit in their characters. And... And this can be true of Seventh-day Adventists as well. We may profess things, but the question is, is God seen in us in how we talk to each other, how we treat one another? <clears throat> she, 
She says, again and again, I've been shown that the people of God in these last days could not be safe in trusting in men and making flesh their arm. The mighty cleaver of truth has taken them out of the world as rough stones that are to be hewed and squared and polished for the heavenly building. They must be hewed by the prophets with reproof, warning, admonition, and advice that they may be fashioned after the divine pattern. This is the specified work of the comforter to transform heart and character that men may keep the way of the Lord. So when we say in this movement that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers, and we take the passage where it says, I will give you the comforter, and he shall convict the world or convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that that is about transforming heart and character, that men may keep the Lord. Right? That is what this movement is about. Now, when we, when we, and what we've been dealing with in, in these studies is the idea that the first and second angel's messages are as much righteousness by faith as is the third. That when Ellen White says the righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, she's talking about the fact that it's real in our life. That we've come to the point, we've passed, we've accepted the first angel's message, and we've accepted the second angel's message, in order that the third angel's message can be proclaimed, so that the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the everlasting gospel, is these three steps. It's not the third step. Correct? Agreed. Yeah. So when she says many are who are explaining the scriptures to others have not conscientiously and entirely surrendered mind and heart and life to the control of the Holy Spirit. We would have to examine our hearts and we could probably say that definitely we have not the control of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Right. So, okay. yeah, go on. Right. Just as a, as a thought. Okay. I'm going to read something, and let's see if, if this goes in line with, with what you're presenting right now. When truth is received into the heart, it sanctifies the soul. And a sincere Christian will walk through life with Christ the pattern ever in view. And he will adhere with noble steadfastness to the singular principles of righteousness in words, in dress, and in deportment. Mm -hmm. He will have respect unto the recompense of reward. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. They might have had opportunity to return, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Whereto God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And this is Review and Herald, December 19th, 1893. Okay. So at this same period of time. Right. Okay. So the, the point that I, I was struck by when I read this is that when the truth is received into the heart, it sanctifies the soul. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked often of justification, sanctification, and judgment. So are we in a position right now where this where the truth has not been fully received into the heart? Well, we could say that definitely 
we have not really understood stood the work that God wanted to do with this movement. Right. And this movement would, and, and that's why our story of uh, our study of, of, of Samson is so interesting because Samson typifies at least this movement. And, and he's a bad example. I mean, he's a good example of this movement, but a bad example of, of what this movement is supposed to be. Right. So, because it, he represents the reality and the reality is we are far from God. We don't reflect his character. We've acted in ways that are very unchrist like in how we've talked about each other, how we've treated each other and how we have lived our life day to day. And so God is calling us through this message, this three step testing prophetic message. He has given us an experience that is meant for us to examine ourselves, right? That's the whole point of that disappointment. Is it not that we examine ourselves? I would agree. Right. I mean, the whole thing about October 22nd, 1844, the investigative judgment begins. But can God really investigate our lives without us? participating in that investigation? No. If, if you understand what I mean in that context, that this is a work of cooperation with God because the investigation is something that is, because it's the third angel's message, it's righteousness by faith in verity, but yet you have people who are unprepared, and we see this all through the scriptures. I mean, we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, we can see their failures. We can look at David and see his failures. Now, we have a hard time finding fault with Daniel, because, and there are some who the Bible doesn't really record anything that they have done wrong. But we know that they, they are also examples of what we can be. So we know the reality of what we are, but we also have examples of what we can be through Christ. So, so we have these encouragements by those who struggled. Jacob is an encouragement because he's given the name Israel when he wrestles with God. And that is the promise to us. Now, let, let's go on and read more because she's going to basically say what she said, just in a different way. So she says, the message we have to bear is not a message that men need cringe to declare. Now, I think here she means cringe because, you know, we have connotations attached with this. But she means basically to, um, to feel that somehow we need to be timid in its declaration. They are not to seek to cover it to conceal its origin and purpose. Now, why would somebody do that? Why would they cover the message, conceal its origin and purpose? Because it exposes their sin. Okay, but in declaring a message, why would we we cover that message? What what is it that about the message that we don't like? I mean, you're partly right there, so. It, uh, it shows. It sh I'm sorry. It yep. shows our. It shows. It shows our sins. Okay, so we we often conceal the message because it's actually speaking against us. We're not ready to present a message that's going to condemn us. We we dress it up. We dress up the gospel in what we consider to be attractive ways. But is the gospel attractive to human nature? No. No, it's um, foolishness to, to the world. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not attractive to our nature. Now, I've always been surprised, and I'm not saying this just to, you know, criticize the Adventist church and make say I'm better, but... The one thing I knew when I became a Christian 
is that the Christian life was a difficult life. God wasn't calling me to some ease. And, and back in the 1970s, I don't know if people are as old as me who remember this, but there used to be these series of advertisements about being born again on television. And it was always how, how much happier your life is going to be, how much better your marriage is going to be, and your children are going to behave properly. And, and, and life was going to be just wonderful when you were born again. But my experience was that to be born again is to be at odds with the world. Things may not turn out the way you want them to when you're born again. But often they don't. Because Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Paul says, I die daily. So, so maybe the reason that men cringe to declare a message is because it's a message they themselves are not wanting to hear, not wanting to apply to their lives. So they want to dress up a message because they want a message that is a message of ease. A message of prosperity. So we're not to seek to cover it, to conceal its origin and purpose. Its advocates must be men who will not hold their peace day nor night, as those who have made solemn vows to God and who have been commissioned as the messengers of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of the grace of God. We are under obligation to declare faithfully the whole counsel of God. We are not to make less prominent the special truths that have separated us from the world and made us what we are. Seventh-day Adventists, I'm adding that there because she makes a similar statement. Now, the prominent, why do people make less prominent the special truths that have separated us from the world? Why do Seventh-day Adventists do that? Some are ashamed because of the disappointment. Okay. Now, we will give a reason. What, what's the reason we give why we downplay our special truths? Well, you don't, maybe don't want to offend anybody. Okay. So, so we say we don't want to offend people. Uh, we want to be wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. You know, when you have um, uh, back in the 80s, um, when the, the National Sunday Law book lit by um, Jan Markison um, and other different projects that have been done through the years by group Adventists, that the church would try to say, well, we have no part to play in that. Right. Something that's going to make that that's going to call out of the papacy. Well. The church is going to, you know, distance themselves from any sort of bold statements of Adventist truths because they want to present a soft message, an attractive message, because we don't want to offend people. But are we going to have conversions? Well, the truth is going to offend, no matter how you slice it. Yeah. You know, as, and as Carl mentions, Adventists don't want to be recognized as a cult. I mean, when I became an Adventist, uh, I mean, the first book I read was Kingdom of the Cults before I'd read any books. So I, I became an Adventist very quickly. Uh, I was already a Sabbath keeper, already believed in the state of the dead, but I wasn't an Adventist. And um, when I became an Adventist, um, I read Kingdom of the Cults. It was pointed out by a pastor uh, from Apostolic Church. Um, to uh, to read this book because you know he because I asked him did I join a cult and he says no you know read the book Kingdom of the Cults um, and, and from that time I understood what a cult is and Adventism is not a cult but the thing is we don't like to be called a cult and and so for many Adventists it, they want to be accepted by the world with this story this narrative well if we are called the cult, we're not going to be able to win anybody to our church. And, and I don't think that's the case. I think people don't care who, who care about the truth, don't care about what kind of label is no. given to the truth. And if you do care, you tend to attract the wrong kind of people. 
Yeah. So we attract people mm-hmm. who... For the wrong reasons, yeah. they're going to attract the wrong ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's been part of the problem um, in Adventism. God has given us light in regard to the things that are now taking place in the last remnant of time. And with pen and voice, we are to proclaim the truth to a world, not in a tame, spiritless way, but in demonstration of the spirit and power of God. Now, of course, there are ways in which people take this sort of statement. And they would take this that we need to present startling truths. We we need to sort of wake people with just wild claims. But that's not what she's talking about. Because this isn't the demonstration of wild claims. This is the demonstration of the spirit and power of God. But it is the life of Jesus Christ in the soul. It is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit alone will make the soul fruitful unto good works. The love of Christ is the force and power of every message for God that ever fell from human lips. Now, this love of Christ isn't something that can be manufactured. It's something that has to be experienced, and it has to be lived out. And we know it's lived out in obedience to God's commandments. You know, if you love me, keep my commandments. But it's not something that's focused upon self and how we see ourselves. It's something that's focused upon Christ and upon those that he died for, the souls around us. When one is fully emptied of self, when every false god is cast out of the soul, the vacuum is supplied by the inflowing of the Spirit of Christ. Such a one has the faith which works by love and purifies the soul from every moral and spiritual defilement. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, can work upon the heart, influencing and directing, so that he enjoys spiritual things. He is after the Spirit, and he minds the things of the Spirit. He has no confidence in self. Christ is all and in all. Truth is constantly being unfolded by the Holy Spirit. He receives with meekness the engrafted word, and he gives the Lord all the glory, saying, God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Now, um, Iran and I were having a little conversation earlier before the study, and we were talking about what happened um, on December 6th, 2020, this um, declaration that was put, uh, put out by FFA for those that were in charge of it. 2021. Uh, it was December 6, 2020, that they put out this declaration. So that's when uh, that's when, so that's when we got disfellowshipped, so to speak. At least I did. Uh, from FFA, right. right? So they kicked kicked me out. And and some others and some they others kicked got, me out too. Yeah. They kicked me out too. Yeah. Lots of people. Do I was. It. I went out on the twenty first or something like that, but that was basically what it was for. Yeah, and I think Stephen got kicked out on my birthday, but uh, anyway, if I remember correctly, he got kicked out on an important date. But 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 the point is, um, in this declaration, when we were looking at it, and and there's a reason why we were looking at it, which we're not going to get into right now, but uh, we will at some point because um, I'm going to prepare something about it. Um, It basically was a repudiation of of the message of FFA, everything that Jeff had done. And because it was a rejection of the symbolic use of numbers as related to time. That is, we couldn't use symbols like the 10th day of the fifth month and the sixth day of the fourth month and July 18th or any of these, these dates as symbols. We couldn't use spans of times as symbols. Now, um, so when we think about that, uh, what was the reason that 
FFA took that position. What was, they stated quite clearly in their declaration. What was the reason that they took this position after we had all this evidence of dates as symbols? Does anybody know? Uh, no time setting. No time. Okay. Well, the reason given is that nothing happened on July 18th. So since oh, nothing yeah. happened, the symbols that had pointed to J July 18th must be wrong. And then, of course, they use Ellen White's statements that there's no time setting. But they quote one from the New Testament is not Christ's words. It's not given you, given you to know the times and the seasons, which the Father has put in his own power. Now, is that true before 1844? Like, is that statement of Christ, is it something that only applies after 1844? Or does it apply before 1844? It applied before. Okay, right? Because who's he talking to? The church. Yeah, he's talking to the disciples, right? Yeah, you're right. Right, and this is Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Right, he says, And when they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we know this is said to the disciples. So if this is forbidding time setting of any kind, would this also have applied to the Millerites? Because the Millerites set time. Yeah, they, yeah. Okay. So if it applied to the Millerites, were they wrong to set the date October 22nd, 1844? No. They were probably no, led they by were, the Holy no. Spirit. Okay, so Rosanna? They were led by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so they were led by the Holy Spirit. Now they were wrong in a sense in that they were predicting the second coming of Christ. And that's not something that they could know Right, because that's not going to be known until it's made known by the Father, because the Son himself did not know this. And we know now know that it's proclaimed by the Father after the special resurrection. So that would be the first time that we know when Christ returns. Now, if we reject July 18th, we know we've also rejected the Lord's leading. Right? We we're saying that God was not leading us. And, and the problem here wasn't so much an intellectual problem. It was the problem of self. Because the reason nothing happened is not a good reason to reject God's leading. Because if we were to do that, we would have all kinds of examples in the Bible uh, that if people had done that, they would not have been, um, they would not have learned the lessons that God wanted them to learn. We have all kinds of people who could look at situations and say, things didn't turn out the way that I expected, so God wasn't leading me. But that's not how God works. Does God lead us in ways that we do not expect? Most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. That's my whole Christian <laughs> life. Every, everything that's happened to me is things that I did not expect or plan. And God leads me in ways that I, I know it's God's leading because he has to tell me to do something that I wouldn't want to do normally and go in a direction I don't want to go. Um, 
but God leads in ways that I just would not have, ne if I'd used my human reasoning, I wouldn't have gone in that direction. So it's the Holy Spirit that allows us to understand God's leading, or at least to follow God. <clears throat> so she says here, um, now we have received not the spirit of the world, right? So that would be the spirit that would just be us using our w own wisdom and judgment. That would be um, different than following God's spirit. So we've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. The spirit that reveals also works in him the fruit of righteousness. Christ is in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He is the branch of the true vine and bears rich clusters of fruit to the glory of God. What is the character of the fruit born? The fruit of the spirit is love. Mark the words, love, not hatred. It is joy, not discontent and mourning. Peace, not irritation. Anxiety, irritation, anxiety, and manufactured trials. So when we think about the work of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, It is quite different from the fruit of the spirit of the world. Now, does God change our situation? So when we have joy, is it because everything's going our way? No. When, when we have love, is it because everyone loves us and we just feel love? We, we would have to say no again, right? Because right. it's not hatred, even though the world would have hatred for how they are being treated. But a Christian can love even when he's not loved. He can have joy even if things are not going his way. He can have peace in a time of conflict. Even though there's things happening around him that would irritate, he's not going to be irritated because he has the spirit of love. He's not going to be anxious. He's not going to have these manufactured trials. It is long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That is the fruit of the Spirit. And those, are, of course, are often people look at the gifts of the Spirit as evidence of the Spirit. So people believe because they speak in tongues or they have the gift of teaching or they have other gifts, that, that that's the evidence that they have the Spirit of God. But the evidence of the Spirit is the fruits of the Spirit the character of Christ. Those who have this spirit will be earnest laborers together with God. The heavenly intelligences cooperate with them and they go weighted with the spirit of the message of truth which they bear. They are a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. They are ennobled, refined, through the sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, they have not brought into the treasury of the soul wood, hay, stubble, but gold, silver, and precious stones. They speak words of solid sense and from the treasures of the heart bring forth pure and sacred things according to the example of Christ. Day after day is passing into eternity, bringing us nearer to the close of probation. Now we must pray as never before for the Holy Spirit to be more abundantly bestowed upon us. And we must look for its sanctifying influence to come upon the workers, that the people for whom they may la they labor may know 
that they have been with Jesus and learned of him. We need spiritual eyesight now as never before, that we may see afar off and that we may discern the snares and designs of the enemy. And as faithful watch, watchmen proclaim the danger, we need spiritual power that we may take in as far as the human mind can the great subjects of Christianity and how far reaching are its principles. When God's people humble the soul before him, individually seeking his Holy Spirit with all the heart, there will be heard from human lips such a testimony as is represented in this scripture. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So where is that quote from? What, what verse is she quoting? What, what point in our history is she talking about? I don't hear anyone. Okay, so Carl says, Revelation 18. It's Revelation 18, verse 1. Isn't that 9-11? <coughs> yes. Now, at 9-11, we know a mighty angel came down, and this movement acknowledges this. But has the earth really been um, lightened with his glory? Well, if we're going to look at, if we're going to take a look at that, are we going to accept that 9-11 was a point in time or that it was a beginning of a period of time or was it both? Yeah, so one of the things we learned in our studies is that our history is a zoom into the Sunday law on Ellen White's big line, right? That is, 9-11 is not part of Ellen White's line. 9-11 is a part of a repeat of history, right? It's, it's both the empowerment of the first angel's message and the arrival of the second angel's message from Millerite history. It's both... August 11th, 1840, and April 19th, 1844. But this is something that's a repeat of history, and we know that the earth, that when Ellen White takes um, Revelation 18, verse 1, she places it at the Sunday law. She doesn't place it at 9-11. She is, no, not, not, line 11 is not on her line. So we know then that this is, a message that is to lead to what she's talking about here. And if the earth is lightened with his glory, how is it lightened? She says, there will be faces aglow with the love of God. There will be lips touched with holy fire saying, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And we know that in this movement, we haven't seen this even amongst ourselves, let alone, you know, we haven't shown this to the world. Those who are under the influence of the Spirit of God will not be fanatical, but calm, steadfast, free from extravagance. But let all who have had the light of truth shining clear and distinct upon their pathway be careful how they cry peace and safety. Be careful what influence you exert at this time. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, the whole multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. The Spirit of Christ made them one. This is the fruit of abiding in Christ. Jesus longs to bestow the heavenly endowment in large measure upon his people. Prayers are ascending to God daily for the fulfillment of the promise, and not one of the prayers is lost. Christ ascended on high, leading captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. When, after Christ's ascension, the Spirit came down as promised, 
like a rushing mighty wind filling the place, the whole place where the disciples were assembled. What was the effect? Thousands were converted in a day. We have taught, we have expected that an angel is to come down from heaven, that the earth will be lightened with his glory when he shall behold an ingathering of souls similar to that witnessed on the day of Pentecost. So Ellen White is telling us that what happened on the day of Pentecost, the fulfillment of the prophet Joel is to be repeated. And we are in that history in which, which that is to be repeated. And if the Holy Spirit was needed at that time, it is much more needed today as we come to the end of this world. Amid the confusion of delusive, do delusive doctrines, the Spirit of God will be a guide and a shield to those who have not resisted the evidences of truth. He silences every other voice than that which comes from him who is the truth and the life. God gives to every soul opportunity to hear the voice of the true shepherd, to receive the knowledge of God and our Savior. When the heart receives this truth as a precious treasure, Christ is formed within the hope of glory, while the whole heavenly universe exclaims, Amen and Amen. We have absolute need of the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. We have no time to confer with flesh and blood. We need to be individually converted. We need the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And this movement has been blessed with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has given us an understanding of the scriptures that has brought a conviction. And with that conviction, a power to change our lives. And that is to be our, our focus. The focus is our individual work in cooperating with Christ in the work he first wants to do in us so that he can work through us so that he can do it in others. We need, we have need of divine illumination. Every individual is striving to become a center of influence. Now, can we think of ourselves as becoming a center of influence? Because often what people look at is some institution or some church or some group of people becomes a center of influence. But every individual is to be a center of influence. And until God works for his people, they will not see that subordination to God is only safety. They, they will not see that subordination to God is the only safety for any soul. His transforming grace upon um, human hearts will lead to unity that has not yet been realized. For all who are assimilated to Christ will be in harmony with one another. The Holy Spirit will create unity. So we need, we need this unity, the unity that happened in the upper room. But where does that unity begin? <clears throat> I remember there was this uh, brother, it was his name Emmanuel, in one of our studies um, after July 18th, he, he thought that the solution is that we need to get a council together. We need to get all of the the leaders in the movement together to have some kind of conference um, and that we needed to find an answer. And of course that wasn't going to happen. Jeff had, had left the movement or left the leadership position in the movement. But what was the real need that we had after July 18th? Could we have brought about unity that way? Okay, Ron? Change of character. Okay, so as individuals, we needed to examine ourselves. 
We needed to allow the work, this three-step testing prophetic message, to do the work that God wanted to do for us. The reason he gave us the message in the first place, because we talk about it being the everlasting gospel, but yet we hadn't allowed the message to transform us. Instead, we could see with the failure of that prediction, all that was manifest was human character. We didn't see the character of Christ being manifested within the movement. We just saw our own characters being manifested. And that means the work had not been accomplished, not because July 18th didn't occur as predicted, but because we never allowed the Holy Spirit to convert us. So the Holy Spirit can create un unity only as every individual is striving to become a center of influence. He shall glorify me. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The Holy Spirit glorifies God by so revealing his character to his people that he becomes the object of their supreme affections and by making manifest his character in them. So the Holy Spirit glorifies God by reveal, revealing Christ, God's character in his people. And God becomes the object of our supreme affections. And it does so by making manifest his character in us. They see clearly that there never was any righteousness in the world, but his. No excellence in the world, but that derived from him. When the spirit was poured out from on high, the church as flooded with light, but Christ was the source of that light. His name was on every tongue. His love filled every heart. So it will be when the angel that comes down from heaven, having great power, shall enlighten the whole earth with his glory. So we know that this angel came down at 9-11, but this is a prophetic movement. It's a prophetic act. And that that work that is to be accomplished is still before us so that we can stand at the Sunday law so that we can bring souls to Christ. The Church of Christ, enfeebled and defective as it may be, is the only object on earth on which he bestows his supreme regard. While he extends to all the world his invitation to come to be saved, he commissions his angels to render divine help to every soul that cometh to him in repentance and contrition. And he comes personally by his Holy Spirit, into the midst of his church. So when we talk about this church that's enfeebled and defective, is this not us? Not that we are like the church and nobody else is, but can't we see that the church of Christ is enfeebled and defective, and yet Christ is going to do a work through us because we're enfeebled and defective but there's going to be a transformation that occurs. Amen. The gift of his Holy Spirit, rich, full, and abundant, is to his church as an encompassing wall of fire, and the powers of hell shall not prevail against it. In their untainted purity and spotless perfection, Christ looks upon his people as the reward of all his suffering, his humiliation, and his love, the supplement of his glory, Christ the great center from which radiates all glory. So when we look at Christ, his love towards us who are enfeebled and defective, it's because he wants to be rewarded. I mean, this is sort of a more of a human idea, but this that he wants to be rewarded for his 
suffering and humiliation. So Christ, just like a father loves his children and pours out everything for his child, Christ poured out everything for us. And we need to reflect his character. That is his reward to see 144,000 represent him to the universe. How can we stand in the day of test if we do not understand the words of Christ? He said, These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. It is the Holy Spirit that is to bring to our remembrance the words of Christ. The theme Christ chose to dwell upon in his last discourse to his disciples was that of the office of the Holy Spirit. He opened before them a wide tract of truth. They were to receive his words by faith. And the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, was to bring all things to their remembrance. The consolation given by Christ in his promise was found in the fact that the divine influence was to be with his followers to the end. So a consolation. What's a consolation? We, we don't often use this word. A consolation given by Christ. So he's giving this consolation to his disciples. What, why, why is he giving this consolate, consolation? Are the disciples disappointed? Yes. Yeah, and, and they have a disappointment. One is Christ died, but even when he's resurrected, he's going to leave them. And so he has to console them, right? Well, you have to get them. If you're consoling someone, you're also providing consolation. Right, yes. And, and he's going to give this comforter. So a comforter is going to console. The Holy Spirit is going to console the followers of Christ when Christ leaves them and goes to heaven. So she says the consolation given by Christ in this promise, that is the promise of the Holy Spirit, was found in the fact that the divine influence was to be with his followers to the end. But this promise is not accepted and believed by the people today. And therefore, it is not cherished by them, nor is its fulfillment seen in the experience of the church. Now, this is quite amazing that people do not believe that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That it's going to be Christ with us through his Spirit. So what does she mean it's not accepted and believed by the people today? She says, the promise of the gift of the Spirit of God is left as a matter to be little considered by the church. It is not impressed upon the people, and the result is only that which might be expected. Spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, Spiritual declension and death. Minor matters occupy the mind and soul, but the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church, which would, if possessed, bring all other blessings in its train, is lacking, although it is offered to us in infinite plentitude. Just as long as the church is satisfied with small things, it is disqualified to re receive the great things of God. Now, can we give an example of this, what we mean, what she would mean by the church is only satisfied with small things? What are these small things that the church pays attention to? Well, I think the church hasn't grown from the beginning. They thought the light was there and they stopped there. Yeah, they I mean... Know. 
Yeah, so the church is not interested in new light, that's for certain. And even to try to understand old light, they're not really interested in any new light that's going to help old light uh, shine brighter. But there, what are these minor matters? Would this be the organization things like evangelistic series, uh, church politics, um, all the different medical missionary works, the schools, the, all of the, the institutions of the church, are those minor matters in the, in the light of the Holy Spirit? Indeed. Yeah, so, and, and do we allow the Holy Spirit to work in others? When, when the Holy Spirit is working in others, isn't the church interested in shutting it down? And, and I would say the reason is because they don't have control. An example that I can give, um, when I was a new Adventist, we had a Bible study in our attic. And so we called it the upper room study. I, I, I never did. I always called it the Saturday night study, but um, everybody referred it to it as the upper room. Now, uh, the church, well, here we had some young, young people who just become new Adventists studying the Bible. Do you think the church was happy? Probably not. It was sanctioned by the church. Yeah, so, yeah, it wasn't something. Yeah, the church hadn't organized it. We just did this on our own. Um, and so I was blacklisted by the church way back then because I had this independent Bible study going on. And, and the reports that they received is, well, one time we were studying some uh, – um, um, Seventh-day Adventist reform movement material, which really was just at one of their papers that had an article by the Spirit of Prophecy by Ellen White, and, and we were studying that. And, and so it was reported that we were, we were uh, Seventh-day Adventist reform. Now, of course, I knew nothing about th that there was even a conference, like a general conference or even an Alberta conference. I didn't know anything about any of this kind of stuff. Um, all I knew is that I was an Adventist and I was studying the spirit of prophecy and studying uh, the doctrines of the church. But the church wasn't recognizing the work of the Holy Spirit in those that it wasn't personally directing. That is, the church was only interested if it could direct and control, and control right? Because something out of their control, something bad might happen. They might go into an offshoot. They might start teaching strange doctrines. So our, our local pastor, who that uh, it was just a small church I was going to at the time, um, he started creating uh, events for the young people on Saturday night. Well, we went to him and said, well, we can't go because we have our, our, our Bible study on Saturday night. And he said, well, you need to do what the church, what the church has organized. The church didn't organize your Bible study. You need to go to the activities that the church has organized. So here we had the work of the Holy Spirit upon people's hearts. The church didn't even recognize it. They were concerned about minor matters. I mean, and the activities they wanted to have were really not anything any of us young people were interested in. I mean, I was, I was 20, 22, 23 at the time, so they figured we might be interested in, you know, gym nights and things like that. Of course, we were just interested in studying the Bible. Um, so so they, should have, they, should have asked you, they should have asked what you were studying, you know, instead of... Yeah. Well, well they finally did, down, and, uh, yeah, they did send the youth pastor... Uh, to our study, and, and he was actually quite happy with it. He, he gave a good report, is what he told me, um, about, about our study. But it still didn't really change how the church looked at it. So um, uh, there's a statement here, when new light is presented to the church, it is perilous to shut yourselves away from it, refusing to hear because you are prejudiced against the message to the messenger against the message to the messenger will not make your case 
excusable before God, to condemn that which you have, um, which you have not heard and do not understand, will not exalt your wisdom in the eyes of those who are candid in their investigations of truth. And to speak with contempt of those whom God has sent with a message of truth is folly and madness. And, and we have to always recognize that God is leading um, a movement as well as individuals. And God has given light to many different individuals in this movement. He's given light to Colin. He's given light to Odilio. Um, he's given light to Stephen. Right? We have we have different people that God has been using, and, and many of uh, people even studying here that you know aren't names that everyone would know. God has given you light. You have studied the scriptures and opened them up, and you have seen things, wonderful things in His law. Wonderful in the sense of things that are hidden, things that have been secret. And you can see those things, and they mean something to you. But we can't, we can't reject the work of the Holy Spirit just because we don't have control over it. We have to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of individuals. <clears throat> She says, um, but why do we not hunger and thirst after the gift of the Holy Spirit, since it is the means whereby the heart may be kept pure? The Lord designs that divine power shall cooperate with human effort. Divine power cooperates with human effort. The Christian life is not an effortless life. It is not a life of ease. We have to stretch ourselves, but it is divine power that we need in order for us to be successful as Christians. It is all essential for the Christian to understand the meaning of the promise of the Holy Spirit just prior to the coming of our Lord Jesus the second time. It is all essential. What does she mean by all essential? It's a hyphenated word. If something's all essential, how is that different than essential? Could we say completely essential? Completely, fully. Um, it is, it's all encompassing. Without the Holy Spirit, to understand the meaning of the promise of the Holy Spirit, we cannot experience the second coming in the way that God wants us to experience it. She says, talk of it, pray for it, preach concerning it. For the Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but of everlasting life. We are living in the last days when error of a most deceptive character is accepted and believed while truth is discarded. The Lord will hold both ministers and people responsible for the light that shines in our day. God calls upon all who claim to believe present truth to work diligently in gathering up the precious jewels of truth and placing them in their position in the framework of the gospel. What is this a reference to? Is this William Miller's dream? Are we to yeah. gather the precious jewels of truth? All the, yes. the light that God's been giving us? People have often said, we don't need this light. I've shown things to Adventists and they say, well, it's interesting, but we don't need it. We have all we need already, but we need to gather up the precious jewels of truth and place them in their position in the framework of the gospel, this three-step testing prophetic message. Let them shine in all their divine beauty and loveliness, that the light 
may flash forth amid the moral darkness. So remember in our study here, when we began this study, we were looking at Ellen White's um, two examples of the Millerite movement, illustrations, right? And in these illustrations, this was about light coming to God's people in the first and second angels' messages. So we need the Holy Spirit because that light is the light of the Holy Spirit. This cannot be accomplished without the aid of the Holy Spirit, but with the aid of the Spirit, we can do all things. When we are endowed with the Holy Spirit, we, by faith, take hold of infinite power. There is nothing to be lost of that which comes from God. The Savior of the world sends his divine messenger to the soul that men may dig for the truth. So we have to dig for it. That's what this movement is all about. It's all about the angel of Revelation 18 coming down and revealing this light of the everlasting gospel to Seventh-day Adventists. Because it is by its revelation that men may dispel the multitude of errors. This is the Christian's work. So what does the church do to protect us from error? I mean, one of the reasons they reject the 2520 is you're, you're going to mislead people. The 2520 is error, error. So what does the church do to protect people from error? Well, they just discolorship people right away. Right. Yeah. So they don't want us to study, right? They don't want the Holy Spirit to be teaching individuals light that the church hasn't authorized. And this is not just true of the church. It's often true of people who believe in this message. We want to control the message. Instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to do its work upon the individual, we want to control that. Now we, Catholic, Catholicism does that. Mm -hmm. And that, we, that men may dig for the truth. Is the church interested in people digging for the truth? It don't appear that way. Yeah, because it's this digging for truth, it's this revelation that has come from the digging of truth that can dispel the multitude of errors. So the church is concerned about all these doctrines, winds of doctrine, and so their solution is to stop people from studying. So if you're studying something the church doesn't approve of, they shut you down. But this, it is this digging for truth that is going to dispel the multitude of errors. And we can see that with this movement, that what this movement has done is gone back to the foundation and seen that it's laid correctly, and that we don't need these other examples of false new light. They, they claim to be new light, but it's false new light. Because it rejects established truths, and new light can never do that, only false light. So this work of the Holy Spirit, I mean, we're going to continue on with this um, um, tomorrow afternoon, at 2 o'clock Mountain Time. So we're going to close with prayer now. That's where we're going to pick up. We're going to read this, and then we're going to get into Joan's article and uh, study some of the history relating to 1888. Not so much the message that was given in 1888, but how... Jones was connected with that history and why this is relevant today. So it's going to take us some time. Yeah. So I, I went a bit over time. I don't like to do that, but we're going to close with prayer. And then uh, if people have questions, you can bring those up tomorrow afternoon as well or comments. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the time that we've had here this evening. Be with us. Give us a good rest tonight. Uh, we pray for the study tomorrow morning, for Dwight's presentation. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has been giving us light from your word and that we need to heed it. We just pray, Lord, that um, you will bless each person in their personal walk with you, that we may come in unity through thy spirit. 
We pray and ask this in Jesus' name.